In this video, I'm going to give my top 10 Pendragon mechanics that other RPGs should use. If you haven't heard, Pendragon is a role-playing game that originated back in the 80s. In Pendragon, you play a knight in King Arthur's England, have adventures and battles in the summer, and then retire to your estate in the winter and watch your family and estate grow. Pendragon is one of my favorite games to play solo, and it does several things that many other RPGs ignore. So I wanted to talk about my top 10 favorite mechanics from Pendragon and why other RPGs should use them. Number 10, armor works differently. In Pendragon, when you're in combat, armor can help protect against damage instead of making it harder to hit. Now the cool thing here is that armor just works differently than it does in Dungeons & Dragons. In Dungeons & Dragons, armor increases your armor class, making it harder to hit your character. But once your character is hit, then they take all of the damage that the enemy can deal with you. In Pendragon, your armor actually reduces the incoming damage from your enemy. This is something that I think other RPGs should consider, is taking a look at armor and using it differently, because so many RPGs just default to what Dungeons & Dragons does, which is make it harder to hit rather than reducing incoming damage. Number 9. Different skills for different weapons. Have you ever wondered why someone is considered a swordmaster, but they can attack with an axe with the exact same proficiency? In Pendragon, each weapon is treated as its own separate skill. If you want your character to be really, really good at lance charges, you can do that. If you want your character to be a master swordsman, you can do that. This is something that I wish other RPGs would do. I wish they would approach using weapons differently and giving players and characters the ability to specialize in different and fun ways rather than having a broad bonus. Number eight, passions, inspiration, and madness. Have you ever created a character that just hates orcs? If you have, you'll probably remember your frustration as your character recklessly jumps headfirst into battle only to have a few unlucky rolls as you watch their heroic moment go south. Well, in Pendragon, your character has something called passions. These are things that your character feels so strongly about that they can use their passion to enhance their roles. So, for example, in combat, your character may be fighting Saxons, and your character may have this passion for hating Saxons. And so what you can do is roll for your passion. If you succeed, you get a massive bonus to your next combat roll against Saxons. Um, of course, in Pendragon, if your passion roll fails, your character might descend into madness. But I think this is really cool, something really cool that Pendragon does. I wish other RPGs would allow characters to have some way to weave their backstory into the mechanics of the game so that when the situation arises, if your character has that hatred of orcs, they can rely on some of that passion in their backstory rather than needing to try and roleplay that out. I think that would be really fun. Number seven, different rules for combat, skirmishes, and battles. Now, Pendragon does something a little bit different when it comes to combat in the game than many other RPGs. They treat combat differently depending on what type of combat is occurring. For example, one-on-one -on -one combat or small-scale combat has different rules than skirmish combat, which has different rules than full-scale battle combat. There is a full expansion book just about full-scale battle combat in Pendragon, and I think the rules are a little clunky. The coolest part about combat in Pendragon with these different types of combat that you run depending on the circumstance is that combat never gets stale. You might have several combats in a single session, but each of them are treated differently because one of them might be one-on-one -on -one combat, one of them might be in a tournament, for example, and then one of them might be a large-scale battle, and every single time you go into combat, each of those will work a little bit differently because of how the game of Pendragon is written. This is something I wish other RPGs would do. I wish they would give more variation to how combat is run depending on the circumstance. So many RPGs are focused so heavily on combat, it would be nice to have variation in how combat occurs so that it wouldn't get stale and it wouldn't put so much effort on the game master to make sure it doesn't get stale. Number six, knighting and in-game titles and relationships. Pendragon is focused around creating and playing a knight in Arthurian Britain. There are quite a few rules around becoming a knight, what it means once you've become a knight, and who your king or queen is once you've been knighted. As your character has adventures, your character may be granted titles of land or nobility, and they'll make allies and enemies. This is something I wish other RPGs did a whole lot more of. So many other RPGs are so focused on earning experience points or gaining gold. Other in-game assets or bonuses or benefits are often just completely ignored. Things like getting nicknames within a game, gaining allies, gaining contacts, gaining enemies, gaining titles in a game. There's a whole bunch of really, really fun things that you can do and so many of them 
just rely on the old fashioned experience and gold as a way and means to progress within the game. And I wish other games would focus on giving these other more thematic benefits when characters do something good, just like Pendragon does. Number five, flirting romance, and marriage. When you play Dungeons and Dragons, there's always a player who wants to play the lustful bard. But Pendragon takes a much more nuanced view on this topic. Included in the game is flirting, romance, marriage, and a few other things. And since the game is set during Arthurian Britain, these items are not mutually exclusive. For example, flirting may occur outside of marriage, marriage may not be born from romance, and in fact, defining what these items mean, what it means to flirt, or what it means to have a romance is nuanced in its own right. Flirting may be as simple as smiling dur during a feast or, or having a conversation with somebody that you are not in a marriage with. Romance may be a long flowery poem or, or championing a lady or another knight during a tournament. So many games ignore or barely accommodate this basic human instinct, this idea of attraction. Pendragon does an excellent job of not only allowing for it to flourish and massively impact gameplay, but it also has a lot of nuance in how it can be applied to your game. Number four, personality traits. This one isn't everyone's cup of tea, which is why it's my number four and not my number two. So in Pendragon, each knight has a set of personality traits that are treated as a sliding scale. For example, your knight may be honest or deceitful. Now, the best thing in my opinion about these personality traits is that there are circumstances in Pendragon where these personality traits can determine your knight's behavior even if you don't want your knight to act that way. I think the loss of player control in very specific situations can be a ton of fun and you see that in literature all over the place. For example, Harry Potter, think about all the times Harry Potter loses his cool and, and does some magic thing when he shouldn't have. And then Harry has to deal with the fallout of that moment where he lost control of his emotions and did something he shouldn't have. And it, it plays out the exact same way in Pendragon. For example, your character may arbitrarily behead someone because they thought they were a criminal without actually going through some sort of fact finding or, or just process. And then they have to deal with the damage control around that because maybe the person they beheaded was important or maybe the common folk are just really angry because your knight just beheaded someone arbitrarily. These moments can be very, very fun, and Pendragon enables these moments with personality traits, and I wish more games would do that. Number three, base building, winter phase, and solo scenarios. Pendragon is set up for episodic play in a really, really strong way. So if you are playing a campaign in Pendragon, you play what's called a winter phase. This allows you to see what events happen within your estate while you were away. It allows you to update your economics and then make upgrades and updates to your estate. It's essentially a base building phase. Included in, the, in this phase is a really, really great thing called the solo session. Basically, if you sit down to play a game of Pendragon at the table and one of the players cannot make it, that person can come back the following week and very, very quickly roll up a solo scenario and create a quick story. It's a really, really great way to very quickly create a story about why that character was gone the last year. And I wish more RPGs would do this. And the base building is a part of that. No matter how many sessions you might miss, your base will already always be available to continue to update if you, even if you're not there for the session. And I really think that Pendragon is set up for players who can't make a session in a really, really strong way. Number two, family genealogy and horse survival rules. One of the greatest parts of a Pendragon campaign is that when your knight dies, that's your character, when your knight dies, you have a well-crafted family tree that you can go and find a new knight, pick them, and play with them going forward. This is because of the family genealogy rules within Pendragon. Each winter phase, which is what I just talked about, you're basically going to roll dice to determine family events. You'll make family survival rolls. You'll identify if new family members were born. You can even determine if your horse survives the year or not. I wish other RPGs would bring family members or family connections or something like that into games more often because they're such strong story hooks and there's a lot that you could do with it. And number one, feasts. Oh, feasts. Holy cow, am I in love with feasts in Pendragon. So in Pendragon, feasts present these really interesting social encounters that you play as your knight. In the base rules, they allow for things like flirting, which can lead to romance or more, intrigue, where you can lean, learn secrets about what's going on, or other fun encounters like dueling another knight or making allies or enemies. 
But there's also an expansion to Pendragon. Along with that expansion comes something called the Feast Deck. It's basically a deck of cards that gives you a social encounter and it gives you outcomes based on your response and your roles to those social encounters. Feasts are so cool in Pendragon because it's a time where your character can just sit down, enjoy a meal, and have social interactions. You know, eating is such a core part of the human experience and yet so many RPGs ignore eating. It's, it's kind of mind-boggling. Now, one of my favorite recent purchases is called the Monster Overhaul. It's by Skirples, and it's basically a monster manual that's, in my opinion, better than a monster manual, and it's formatted and written in a way that's creative, useful, and gorgeous. Now, one of the things included in the Monster Overhaul is what happens if different meat is consumed of the monsters that are in the book. It's such a cool idea that is ignored far too much in RPGs. More RPGs need to focus on food and what it's like to eat or what happens during meals, and Pendragon does such a good job of that with feasts. And that's it. These are my top 10 Pendragon mechanics that other RPGs should use. I want to know what are your thoughts? What Pendragon mechanics would you like to see more of in RPGs? Let me know in the comments below. Thank you, and I'll see you in the next video.